Thai Confederation of Taino People, and I have the pleasure uh, to be a moderator uh, for today's program, Looking Ahead to Life After COVID, uh, this IITC webinar. Uh, bienvenidos a todos. Me llamo Roberto Mucaro Borrero. Soy Taino, de representante del Confederación Unida del Pueblo Taino. Uh, Voy a ser el moderador para el evento de hoy. Y uh, para empezamos, voy a compartir algunas instrucciones, primero en, en inglés, después en español. Roberto uh, speaking in Spanish now. He's going to first give the instructions in English and then in Spanish. Yes, so for all those folks who are just signing on uh, to our IITC webinar, uh, if you'll just give me a moment, I'm going to share a screen. Uh, with you first, I'll be sharing this information in English, then I'll be sharing the information in Spanish. So we just ask for a few minutes of, of patience uh, so that we're all on the same page and can enjoy uh, the wonderful presentations today. So let me get to this screen here. All right, had a little delay there, but uh, these are the, the instructions for the interpretation. We will be having a Spanish-English interpretation simultaneous. So uh, here's the quick instructions in English. First thing, make sure you have the most updated version of Zoom. That application is free and uh, probably should restart your computer before starting a Zoom session. But you're, if you're already in here, the most important things right now are one, in, locate the interpretation icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. You'll see uh, a globe uh, symbol at the bottom of your screen. You want to uh, click on that. Once you click on that interpretation icon, you can see the uh, uh, photo, uh, an image here of that globe. It says interpretation icon. Once you see that icon, click on that. Then you want to click on, if you're speaking and want to hear English, make sure you click on English, right? Right after that, and this is very important, you want to click on mute original audio. So click on English first, then mute original audio. If you don't do that, you'll be hearing both languages at the same time, and it'll be very hard to uh, follow the program. Um, just so that you know, if you have any questions or comments, we'll be using the chat icon also located at the bottom of your screen, you'll see it says chat. If you want to ask a question uh, to any of the panelists, please type it in there and I will uh, forward that question uh, to the panelists uh, so that they can answer. Now uh, for the English speakers, just another uh, moment of um, patience while I go through this in Spanish. Y ahora para los que hablan español, aquí uh, son las instrucciones para la Roberto is speaking in Spanish and giving the instructions Jim, now. Jim, I don't know if you need to uh, interpret in English because they already heard this interpretation. So yes. we'll just go, uh, primero, uh, la más importante, puede ver el icono de interpretación que está aquí uh, uh, en su pantalla. Seleccione, it, it's in a, uh, el imagen está en el parte inferior de la derecha de su pantalla. Ahí es un globito. Ahí seleccione español. Aquí es una imagen que tú puedes ver. Dice español. Seleccione eso. Y después, y esto es muy importante, mute original audio, que quiere decir apaga el audio original. Es importante, seleccione ese, apaga el audio original, porque si no vas a escuchar los dos idiomas al mismo vez. Para cuestiones, comentarios, puede usar el icono de, de chat. Y después de esto, voy a volver en inglés porque tenemos la traducción, la inter interpretación. Gracias por su paciencia. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, we have some great speakers today on our subject, looking ahead to life after COVID. Uh, what have we learned? What should we keep and strengthen? And what do we need to change uh, or let go of? 
So uh, I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, right now, who will give a brief introduction on that subject and on this webinar series, uh, Andrea Carmen. Uh, she's from the Yaki Nation. She's the Executive Director of the International Indian Treaty Council. Andrea, you have the floor. Roberto, thank you very much. And I'm going to give a very brief introduction because I'm really looking forward to the presentations by the activists, the knowledge holders, the elders, the young people that we have on this webinar today. Starting on April 24th, uh, going all the way through um, June, uh, the International Indian Treaty Council sponsored eight webinars focused on um, the rights of Indigenous peoples in the COVID epidemic, including uh, facilitating input for um, the study, which will be published very soon uh, by the UN Special Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but hearing from Indigenous peoples from many, many different regions about the impacts that they were suffering um, uh, on their health, um, on their environment, on governments to advantage of the situation, to push through imposed development, pipelines, deforestation, as well as um, panelists talking about uh, the traditional medicines and, and ways of life and food sovereignty that they are revitalizing and strengthening and using uh, to combat um, this pandemic. I know that many of our communities have um, experienced uh, devastating losses, including losses of traditional elders and family members. Here in southern Arizona, the pandemic is still going strong, um, affecting our, our reservations and tribal communities. I know a manager who's sitting across the table from me um, just lost one of their knowledge holders. And we actually have in, in our Yaqui Nation in northern Mexico, our board member from there, Mariano Ochoa, oh. is still in the hospital. Um, in Ciudad Regón, uh, many of you know, you know, he, he was very, very ill, but we had ceremonies and he escaped being put on a ventilator. Um, now he's recovering, but it's going to be a slow recovery. And he's a very important person to the International Indian Treaty Council, uh, to our family and to the Yaqui Nation. And um, I, know, I know we've all suffered losses, um, and are, are scared for our family. Myself uh, and my family actually went through having COVID. And uh, luckily we weren't so sick as, as many. We didn't have to go in the hospital, but it was still very difficult to go through that. And we really rely on our traditional medicines to pull us through that. And I'm really happy and thank all of you for your prayers and support. Many did ceremonies for us as well. So these are some of the things that we're thinking about. We're not through this looking back. Um, some um, nations and, and areas uh, weren't so hard hit or went through it already. So we need to start to think about what is the lesson here for us as uh, individuals, as families, as um, indigenous nations. Um, and where do we go from here? What is the lesson? I know it's gonna take longer than this for us to really absorb what we're being told here by the creator, you know, where humans are really um, being singled out for this disease and the impacts. Um, but we also know as indigenous peoples, this is not the first pandemic that we've suffered. Um, these things were brought to our shores and in some cases purposefully infected um, our peoples. And we are those um, descendants of, of the survivors. And so uh, we need to think about all these things um, as we go forward starting today. And I'm really, um, interested to hear what our knowledge holders on the on the webinar today and we're going to have uh, at least of these discussions um, coming up so with that uh, i would like to turn over the floor to roberto to introduce our first speaker and uh, we just have four speakers so we hope at the end there'll be time for people uh, for them to respond to questions and comments that you put on the chat um, thank you for joining us and uh, 
with that, I, I turn the floor back over um, and we'll be listening with anticipation to the words that we'll be hearing today. Chokdesia, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for that introduction and uh, for sharing all of this information with us. And as you said, we're going to be turning it over now uh, to our special uh, guest presenters today. And I have the great honor of inviting first uh, Hini Wirangi Koho. She's a Maori elder. Uh, she's a founder and director of Te Wanao O Te Rau Aroa. I hope I pronounced that right. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, she's from Aotearoa or New Zealand. And I also learned today that she's also uh, has the, she is also a member uh, of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Uh, so it's another high honor. And so we're very um, honored to have her with us today. So Hine, as we call you um, with a term of endearment in that way, uh, please we welcome you to uh, share with us. You have the floor. Tēnā koutou katoa, um, greetings to you all, and it's a, a, a real privilege to be able to share with you what went down for us in terms of COVID-19. What went down for us in Aotearoa was, and I loved it, but we, it was shutdown time. We were shut down. That meant that we couldn't go out. The stores, the, the necessary things were open but even then you went out in single and only sing say social distancing was really really important we went out with masks if we had to go to the supermarket they weren't shut down at all they, they were needed the necessary things so we had our government set it in that way our government also tried to know, look at those then that were without, you know, jobs, without money, without anything. They, they created things such as, you know, such as wages, subsidies, so that, so that people that were really in need were being taken care of. And then not only that, they ensured they had boxes full of food for the elders and you know for all of those people that were needy and 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 certain members of communities actually delivered that to their community knowing where all their elders were so in in many many ways it was hard for a number of small small businesses but this was about life and people were used to being invaded by all kinds of things. We need to get a political analysis and understand that it's out to destroy indigenous peoples of the world. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if it was HIV pandemic, if it was a flu pandemic, it was also colonization pandemic and still affecting us today. But in terms of what happened during that time, it was great. It was the time where I had to clean up my backyard. Now you have a look at your own reservations and your own house and your own place and start to put it in order. It was an opportunity to, to, to write stories for my children so that they would know who I was as their mother. My 18 children that I, I raised and to be able to put together a whole lot of genealogical lines so they understood north where they were from, who they descended from. It was a huge opportunity to do that and to be really putting together because we're elders. You know, we, 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 how would you like to die? You know, what would you like your children to do? We leave our babies in such disarray when we pass away without giving them instruction. So it was about giving them instruction. It was about being creative in the ways that I want to do. We had to have bubbles. So my babies were all in my bubble. So, you know, and there's, we stayed close. I, all my kids brought their kids to their houses and stayed in their bubbles, safe and sound. Um, until one such time as Aotearoa, New Zealand, you know as New Zealand, actually became free of the bug. And all that was ever come was those that were coming into the country, but within the country, 
it wasn't so. We had several, several weeks of normality until just recently again, but we always knew that somewhere along the line that, that COVID-19 would creep back in. And so we're now on what we call, we were on levels. Uh, we're now, level one was where we're clear, level two, and we're in Hamilton, we're in Waikato district. We are on level two because they found about nine people there in, in hospital up in Auckland. So then Auckland became went back to level three. So that level four is shut down. Level three is close to shut down. We're at level two, if the rest of the country. Our government will make a decision whether the rest of the country closes down again, but that's theirs. But this is time to clean up, a time of reflection, a time to think, you know, to think about how we need. I don't believe that our, our own medicines will clean up such a mess as COVID-19. This has been specially, specially delivered to us and that way we had to watch who delivers and how it got to us. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I, I, I had time to plant, to plant and, and put in a winter garden and, and clean up my forest that I had planted. My forest is a rongoa forest. It's a healing, healing medicine trees that we have, that you find very hard to find in Aotearoa, but I grew a forest on the back of my property so that my children would grow with it. It was time to clean, to take, take stock of what do I leave for my babies? What, what, what knowledge base? Elders, time to write. If you can't write it, then get a, you know, a, one of those young people in your bubble, have them record you. And, and, and just time to, if you're an artist, then time to paint, time to sing, time to compose, I, rather than being in a doomsday place is to rise above it and be, get rid of all your fears and what have you. If, if I'm supposed to die of COVID, and I will. But you know, I'm still here and surviving. And surviving in a very happy space. So it's time, I'm doing a PhD. So it's time to do my writing, my PhD, my research. It's all, it's all about you and what you do to rise up above such a pandemic and not to let it run your life, but to, for you to take, take your own power, inner power back and stand tall in what we call an Aotearoa Māori and stand tall in your own mana. And it's time for that. It's time to take each child in your life and write stories you remember about that, that child. Create a booklet for each child, a scrapbook. Put all the photos that you have in that of that child in there. All their school reports that tell tales about how they don't study, and all of those naughty things that they have done, and you've got be able to talk that story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what a beautiful legacy that you'll be able to leave for your babies. So that's what I did. That's what I did. Oh, and I got Pijoa trees, these beautiful, yummy fruit trees out the front of my property. And they're such a generous plant. They drop Pijoas every day. So to get some exercises, I went out there, bent down and picked up all my Pijoas one by one. Then came inside and I bottled them. Canned. That's what you Americans say, canned. I can I can thirty five bottles of beautiful fijoas, you know, for my babies when they want to make, you know, make sponge and beautiful cake with fijoa and cream and custard. There you go. You have those sorts of things. Those are the things that are important. So we learned to, but in our bubble to do those old things that our old elders used to do instead of just always depending on going down to get a can of peaches down at countdown or down at the supermarket. Hey, it's learning to become independent of all of those things, people. Yeah, I know that in this house, I can live in it for two years without having to go to a supermarket because I can live out of my garden. What are you doing? And how are you doing that? Are we still just worrying about the pandemic instead of live, looking about living? and how to live traditionally, 
how to give up all of our, you know, to just you know, European Western paradigms, Western ways, and go back to traditions. It's about knowing what your relationship is with the Earth Mother. We say talk about it, but we don't actually practice it. Anyway, have a good day. Tēnā koutou. E mihi atu kia koutou i tēnei wā. Te wā o naia nei. Te wā naia nei. Tēnā koutou. I thank you all for listening for this short moment in time. Kia ora koutou. Back to you, Alberto. <laughs> thank you so much, Hine. Uh, always love to hear you speak and, and what you have to share with us and you know, for sharing what you've learned and that uh, kind of time for introspection, time to think about family, food security at, at the, a very micro level, all of those things. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, right now, I have the great pleasure to introduce another uh, well-known elder, uh, somebody that I'm always uh, very proud to work with, uh, like Kine and others on, on this panel. But uh, I want to introduce right now uh, Francois Paulette, who's a Diné Nation elder. He's from the Northwest Territories and what's known today as Canada. And uh, he's a recent recipient of the Order of Canada, which is a, a very high honor in the, in the country. And uh, he's looking forward to picking up that that award, I imagine, soon. So with that, uh, Francois, uh, you have the floor. Please unmute yourself. And thank you very much for being here. Well, Leslie? You have the floor. You can go anytime. Yeah, 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 yeah. something happening here. Okay. Uh, salut, Ine. We can hear you. Uh, Masi Norsi. So, Hoyas Kia Sidri, Tata Nero Intersee, the Pazi Hato Sasia. I am just uh, <clears throat> want to thank you all. I'm just uh, burning some sage here in my talk. <clears throat> I just, I'm just thinking about all the people that have perished in this, in this uh, COVID. You and seem I, to have some lag, at least I'm, I'm hearing the lag on your end. What's that? There's a little bit of distortion on your end. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, please, please go ahead. I just said I lit a, a sage here. I just want to... Uh, Think about all the people that have perished with this COVID. And uh, it has been prophesized a long time ago. And uh, the Spanish flu that was hit here in the 19, early 1900s, 1918, our people went through that. And our people that were living on the land found a way of how to to deal with the, with that sickness. It's been said that people, the elderly people, were put on these islands, and uh, they were given firewood, and the men that were hunting, that were healthy, would put the food on the shore and these people would come and pick it up. And that's how they survived. And for the people, it was not the end of the story. And it was prophesied again that something stronger and bigger would hit. And that is what we are faced with today. So I come from the North, the North Door. And I'm, in many ways, we are very fortunate to be up here because we are still close to the land. Here in the North, I think there's been five cases of COVID. Our borders are closed. 
Uh, nobody can come come in here unless they're family. But if people come from the other parts of the world, they're not allowed in here. And uh, in our tribe, the Dene Nation supports that. So it's uh, we are trying to work and work with this COVID. We see it on the news all the time. And now, as our people in the past planned of how to deal with it, we are now having to deal with this. But this COVID is just one part of further prophecies that are yet to unfold. So we are given an opportunity to prepare, to plan. And that is going back to the land. This COVID has provided some fresh air, cleaner air. But the water, the river that I live on by this huge river, since its breakup, that water has been high, unusually high. The people living on Great Slave Lake are witnessing the lake over a meter. Yellowknife, where all the, the docks are, that's just about over, it's overflowing the dock. But another thing that's happening is there's a shot from the air where this river dumps into this beautiful big lake. It's just murky. It's just like mud. And people have never seen that before. And the fishermen that are going out to fish on the lake, and they're having to deal with debris. I mean, uh, drift logs from the river and they're being caught in their nets. But the important thing for the people here is returning back to the land. And the young people need to learn the ways of the bush. It's a huge task to do that. If you weren't raised like that, I'm fortunate to have raised my children in that way so they can be self-sufficient on the land to, be, to become hunters, to fish, and that's a big responsibility that we have. And this part of this preparation, this plan, we need to have discipline, discipline. If we don't have discipline, and then we will be like many of the people in, in the South, that the figure going to the bars and parties is all right and they're impacted. And one thing that we are told is to have ceremonies, Thanksgiving ceremonies. And all tribes have that. We do that here through feeding of the fire ceremony, other ceremonies where we give thanks. Even though things around us may not be as good as it could be. Because when these natural disasters hit, 
but forest fires, floods, we are spared. So the Creator, our ancestors, take us through that difficult time, but through ceremonies, we can have a sense of what people call to, uh, to avoid these disasters. And it takes discipline to do that, of course. One thing that we are now having to look at, and we had never did that, is food security. When we're thinking about building food caches, traditional food cache, like in the past. So where we put uh, the berries away. <clears throat> right now, uh, this year has been a very unusual, lot of rain, but with that came a lot of berries. There's all kind of berries. So we are starting to harvest that. And when we harvest it, we can put it away for the winter. That's what was learned in the past. Today we can freeze it. So anything like fish, people have learned to vacuum pack the fish so it can stay longer and fresh. So we are doing that. So if we are, if we go hunting and we get food, we share it and we also put it aside. And uh, one thing about these caches, food caches, we are now doing research. We are going to begin to do research in the best way of how we are going to tackle this. And we can think about traditional models, traditional forms of how we did that in the past. And one thing that has to be engineered in this is that we need to put in solar power, solar energy. So this uh, food shelter is totally on its own. If electricity dies, it can still function. The food can be still looked after and medicines. Like I was just talking about medicines, the river is high on the, so it's flooded all the shores. And the medicines that grew on the shore is no longer there. So we have to go elsewhere to find these medicines. It is a, in some ways, uh, in this Western way of life is going to become a thing of the past. And people are going to return to the land. Even if they're plotting their little gardens, big gardens, hunting, uh, fencing buffalo, fencing elk, whatever it is that they're going to do. That is what we need to do. That is what we need to plan. And uh, one thing about this prophecies is that when the bigger events hit, And where people can't, you say there's going to be a migration of people north. 
people moving to the north. I dreamt about that because they're gonna take refuge here in the north. And the non-indigenous people will be part of this migration. And they are gonna be looking for two things, food and water. When they first came here a long time ago, it was prophesized that these white people would come into our territory. That was before Treaty 8. Where I live here, just across the road is where a treaty was made, 1899, July 17th. It has been prophesied that these white people would come into our country uh, looking for two things, gold and this oil, liquid, so they can make the money and they will leave. <clears throat> but they will return, they say, with tears in their eyes, looking for food and water. So when I hear this, the planning, we are given the opportunity to plan and prepare for what is yet to come. And we as indigenous people, we need to do that. We need to kind of put this Western thinking aside, this domination of how they do things, of controlling our people, controlling the water, the lands. And we just need to do it just the way our people have done it in the past. And we have elders yet that's going to lead us on that journey and our teachings, our learnings will put us on that path. So when I, when I look at this COVID, I have to always look at the prophecies, what is here today and the path that we're gonna be on tomorrow. That's pretty clear, pretty clear. But the young need to learn the bush ways. It's a difficult job, but it must be done. So my dear friends, uh, I'm so happy to be part of this small session. And I welcome other people from other parts of the world that are listening in. And thank Andrea, the organizers, for making this possible. Masi Cho. Masi Cho, thank you so much, Elder Francois, for those words, uh, taking them to heart, talking about uh, our youth, getting them back to the land, the importance of back to the land. And again, you're highlighting food security, which is, you know, an ongoing theme with, with our folks as we look uh, to life uh, after COVID. And so all of these things that you shared, very important. And I thank you so much uh, for being here with us. I now have the, the great pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Miriam Cunningham. She's Mosquito. She's the president of the Fund for Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean or FILAC. And she's a former chair of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Also, she has a medical background. She's just an incredible person and just, just so honored that she could be here with us uh, today to share a little bit of, of her perspectives uh, coming from Nicaragua. Uh, Mirna, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roberto. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you very much IITC for this invitation to be here and share my thoughts. I'm doing this from Bilwi in the autonomous region in the Northern Caribbean region of Nicaragua, a region where we have been constructing 
an autonomous process in the region that's multi-ethnic that recognizes the collective rights of indigenous peoples during the last decades we've been working on this process and i want to share some of my thoughts that uh, we have carried out in what's called the indigenous latin american platform facing covid 19. this is made up of many organiza indigenous organizations from latin america and the Caribbean that's organized in the Abe Ayala Forum. And together with FELAC, another indigenous organization, we have been getting together, working together in order to position the ideas of indigenous peoples so that we can give value to what indigenous peoples have been doing as we face this pandemic in order to advocate our agenda, international agendas when we face the states and international organizations in order to save lives, in order to ensure the survival of indigenous peoples. What have we learned during these last few months? Well, we have learned that that pandemic has deepened a crisis situation that we were already living as a society. And it also has allowed us to see more clearly some of the aspects that we already knew about, but now they are even more evident. We have confirmed that the dominant economic and social model based on the unlimited exploitation of nature and people is something that is not sustainable and it must be changed. The impact of COVID-19, but also other epidemics and other forms of extraction of resources have destroyed the animal habitat. And this has destroyed the balances that have been going on for thousands of years. And this has allowed the virus to look for new lodgings, let's say. And obviously they found a new lodging in us as human beings. So we have also confirmed that the majority of the major majority of indigenous peoples in this region have a greater vulnerability as regard to the different areas, health, social, economic, and cultural aspects. This is nothing new, but as we're hearing that this message is going is being talked about in other spaces that this vulnerability has really hit us hard as indigenous peoples we have seen that the immunological weaknesses of many communities has increased the higher statistics of deaths in our communities there were more than 70 thousand indigenous peoples that have been infected and more than 2,000 that have passed away. And this is due to deficiencies of food and health um, sanitation. And what's been managed in our documents and in statistics is what is really happening in practice and in truth. And another thing that we have seen in this pandemic is that the majority of our governments and the states and political sectors, we are not relevant to them, uh, those sectors that govern countries. With very few exceptions, we have seen two things. Indigenous peoples do not appear in the statistical data. We still do not have official, moderately reliable figures that says how many infections, recoveries, and deaths there have been among indigenous peoples. And also it has been become very clear that the basic public services, health, education, food, are not designed to reach indigenous peoples, not at 
in the those that live in the urban area and much less those that live in the rural areas and also we have seen the limitations of multilateralism of the international organizations both global and regional they have not been able to provide a coordinated response even though this is a global problem and in midst of that drama one very positive fact is that we have proven the enormous capacity that indigenous peoples and communities have to face and respond so efficiently to such a serious problem as this pandemic hundreds of communities throughout our region have decided to isolate them isolate themselves collectively they have closed their barriers, their communities, they have made better their internal functioning and their link with the outside world. They've gotten organized, they've strengthened their traditional health systems. They've also strengthened the use of their own languages. They have been able to apply different um, strategies to overcome the problem of food of food problems and with that we've also seen a great participation of indigenous women and also the support of young people and these actions are continuing to be developed in order to face the virus and deal with it so then we think what should we preserve and strengthen well i think there are at least two things first we need to conserve and strengthen our capacity to uh, generate our own evidence right the organizations that have like observatories or mechanisms to know how the virus is affecting us in our um, communities what communities are greater risk in order to move their elders from those communities well and that capacity we need to really keep and strengthen it and the other thing that we need to keep and strengthen all the good community practices these must be supported that women and men and women of the community have been able to promote like traditional medicine the use of our own languages our own agricultural practices that we used to use before to go back to our territories i'm also up here I have my own garden my own orchard right in front of my house I'm I'm going back to preparing that garden taking care of it I'm returning to the earth once again to create our own capacities our own skills in order to generate uh, sustainable conditions and during these months we have been able, we have proven that the virus cannot destroy our knowledge it cannot destroy our values like our solidarity nor the exchange of knowledge that we have nor can it prevent us from organizing us to bring out the best in us as individual as peoples and as indigenous peoples we are providing massive moving and efficient responses now what should we change or what should we get rid of discard well for example there are two things that i think should change within indigenous organizations this period has reaffirmed the key importance that we have of unity for purpose and proposals the coordination of actions especially at the regional and global level the fact that we have this indigenous platform in the region this has opened up the possibility for dialogue at least for example setting forth the pro the proposals that we can have at the regional and at the global level and with regard to public policies what should we change obvious we obviously we need to change uh, those that are of the state we need to change to have profound change that the state has uh, the state's myopic vision that the state has of our culture 
that in the pandemic has shown that it's insufficient and, and incapable of guaranteeing the rights of indigenous peoples, it's essential that we work together with strength and in alliance with the social, social sectors that share our point of view in order to prevent the continuation of the invisibility of indigenous peoples in order to prevent this lack of intercultural dialogue. So in this aspect, we believe that we need to continue to put our maximum skills, capacity, commitment in order to promote spaces for dialogue so that after this health emergency, we can definitely promote that vision of development that we as indigenous peoples have that has to do with us. It has to do with the environment. It has to do with the rest of our co-human beings. And this has to guarantee, this vision has to guarantee that the instruments that exist for indigenous peoples, we have to fulfill them. We have to, there, there can't be any more an, ex, uh, an excuse not to fulfill, fulfill these instruments. We have to promote, um, the attention to emergencies and uh, have a long-term vision. Two days ago, I was at an event with indigenous women from Peru. And what the, our sisters were asking for was oxygen, oxygen. So they wouldn't, their family members and their community wouldn't die. So we need to respond to these actions of emergency, but we have to have a long-term vision. And why is that? Because we are vulnerable. As indigenous peoples, we are vulnerable. And this is because of structural, historical causes that are not going to be solved only with emergency measures. And definitely for the future, we need to have a holistic approach. Although the economic and health aspects are fundamental to be considered at this time, we cannot consider this unless we tie them to, without addressing the political, cultural, social, and other aspects of the current context. So then we need to really have a holistic approach, an integral vi vision. As indigenous peoples, we need to have an agenda for transformation. And this requires profound, deep changes in order to improve our reality to have an intercultural uh, um, vision that responds to each of the indigenous demands of indigenous peoples. And we really need to have concrete responses and from the regional platform of indigenous peoples in Latin America, we are promoting a process of dialogue and uh, together with international organizations, among ourselves, with other sectors, so that we can come together to agree on how, what kind of guidelines, what kind of lines of work we want to have for the future. So it really is urgent that we are able to uh, respond to the causes that have created such a, a difficult pandemic situation. But for this, we need to agree on improving the conditions of men and women, of indigenous peoples, of all the groups, of all ages, but re really for the conditions of all people who live on this region of the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mirna, for sharing all of what you shared, so important on so many levels, talking about the, like the system, uh, does not respond uh, to us as indigenous peoples, the systems that surround us and the invisibility of indigenous peoples. You also brought up the idea of isolation and in communities, uh, people taking, uh, that was also brought up, taking that response. It was also brought up by our previous speakers as well. The community is taking it upon themselves to, to keep, you know, to protect themselves, protect their communities through that isolation. And, and uh, also I like the, the idea of this, really calling out this myopic vision of all these 
governments and powers and, and even agencies that attempt to help uh, and, and not really listening or not really taking into consideration the, the generational knowledge that, that our peoples have. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all of that. And um, right now I want to get to our, our final speaker, our last but not least uh, speaker, uh, Jeannie, Jeannie, Jeannine Yazi, who's a Diné or a Navajo. She's the IITC Sustainable Development Program Coordinator, and she's been part of a command center for COVID relief in her region. And uh, she's gonna share a little bit more. It's always a pleasure to work with her uh, in this format or when we're uh, together in these international arena, uh, climate change, sustainable development. So Janine, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was a little scared you forgot my name there, Roberto. <laughs> uh, it always really feeds my heart and my spirit to listen to Myrna, Francois, Hine, and our other colleagues that always carry this land-based traditional wisdom to all of these discussions because it's so important. Um, as many of you know, if you attended our previous series of webinars, um, I've been speaking from here from my home base near the Navajo Nation in the Southwest United States um, as part of a community that was hit pretty early and very hard by the spread of COVID-19. And as a result, we organized um, fairly early before the first case was confirmed on our traditional territories because we knew in working for years in our, in our um, nation that a lot of the challenges that we faced, both structural in terms of just lack of access um, to critical community infrastructure, uh, such as paved roads, um, but also endemic um, forms of oppression, systemic oppression, that made our communities particularly vulnerable because of the prevalence of environmental contamination, the existence already of a health pandemic as a result to the exposure of that contamination by many of our communities, whether it was from uranium, from the excessive coal mining, from the oil and gas fracking activities that are taking place in our homelands, um, but also the, the legacy of colonization and the way that it disrupted that relationship to land and that um, stewardship and use of our traditional medicines, our wild foods, um, and, and just our, our life ways that show us and guide us in living sustainably with, with our environment, with the earth. And so I wanted to share a few pictures to kind of give context to um, the situation that we find ourselves in. And this is an example of uh, being on the road to go get critical aid to very remote communities. Um, we don't have um, uh, we don't have named roads. We don't, a lot of our roads aren't paved. And so uh, on Google Maps, this particular address showed up on South Fork Road. And this was the, the entrance, the picture on the left was the entrance to South Fork Road, which is a homemade sign. And then once we turned, And so a lot of times it was a guessing game trying to get to a lot of these homes and really trying to draw from uh, our ancestral knowledge to navigate our way through these mountains and woods um, in order to get to the places that needed the aid the most. Because a lot of our families, not only do they not live with electricity, our running water, um, or any form of phone service, um, but they also lack transportation in a lot of cases, especially our elders. And so needing to get to the homes was a critically important and doing that in a safe and efficient way. And what I really love about the group that I'm working with now and just like the organizers that responded to this is that we came from that knowledge of already working and organizing in our communities. And so we knew how to anticipate a lot of the challenges um, that were preventing aid from getting to the most vulnerable in our communities. But we also anticipated a lot of the internal challenges. You know, um, 
I know a lot of uh, relief efforts when they started uh, ended up having a myopic focus on getting food and water to our most vulnerable, our PPE and hand sanitizers. But when working in our indigenous communities that are in this intersection of dealing with the impacts of climate change, of dealing with endemic poverty, of systemic oppression, you once you start going on the ground, you start to see the breadth of need of our, in our communities, um, especially to protect our most vulnerable. This um, gentleman here is one of our last remaining code talkers, um, and this is his home, and we delivered aid to him just um, a few days days ago. Um, and he was one of those individuals that lives in a very remote area and that was um, skipped in the government response and forms of aid that were being offered to communities because in the government response and partnering with entities like the Red Cross and entities like the National Guard, those outsiders, when they come to our homelands, often have no context, no history, no understanding of um, the conditions of our people and how to best reach them. And they'll set up in places that are already developed and easy to access. And so only those with internet access or with phone service or with vehicles are able to um, benefit from those types of aid models. And so with the work that we're doing um, and the, the new group that I'm, I'm now working with, um, it was a way to shift the work from being about just direct relief aid in terms of food and water to looking at how do we uh, simultaneously address internal challenges because um, with the with the relief group that I was initially working with I, I don't know what it is but I feel like when money becomes too big or too much a focus of how to do things it changes the spirit and the 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 values of getting the work done and I had to leave that group when the narrative became about how this is a multi-million dollar business, whether we like it or not, when the majority of the labor and the success of the relief was built upon the backs of grassroots volunteers. And, and it became kind of exploitative exploitative because our volunteers in our communities aren't the same as volunteers to like white led big nonprofits. These are people who are coming from the same conditions of the people we are serving with the same limitations, lack of income and lack of resources to do the hard work that needs to be done. And they're the ones on the front lines facing the majority of the risk to get this aid out to where it needs to go and they were getting little to no resources. And so this really woke us up to needing to reorganize our relief efforts in a different way, rooted in our cultural values of kinship and also rooted in a political analysis and an anti-colonial analysis so that we know we're not in, our, in, in, in doing this, this work, not replicating harmful cycles of lateral or internalized violence and oppression in our community. And so uh, with this, I joined the sisterhood called Zitlestan, which means mountain woman, and it's a form of strength, like a, a symbol of strength and of our matrilineal culture um, and, and continue to do aid with that lens that this is not about providing uh, handouts for a, in a short term to make us feel good about ourselves. This is about restoring our responsibility as relatives to take care of our most vulnerable in our communities and to do it in a way where we're not just addressing this issue but we're planting the seeds and nurturing the foundation for long-term resilience and sustainability and it, it, it's continuing to be in need despite you know, our cases plateauing or whatever you know that's supposed to mean um, not um, 
we're still dealing with these challenges of how do we recover uh, from not only the immense loss of all of our loved ones that have been taken from us, our community organizers, our advocates, our single mothers who were the sole providers of their households, our knowledge holders, our language speakers. But with this push from the Western world to return back to normal and resume activities, our people are still at a disadvantage to be able to even pretend like that's a possibility. Possibility. Uh, this is a picture of college students who are all parked outside uh, a utility service building in order to access internet because their classes have gone online and we don't have internet in our homes. And the temperature here um, has been very high lately. So sitting for hours in a vehicle just to access Wi-Fi is, is horrendous. And so with the group that I'm working with um, and taking this lens, uh, the lessons that we've learned have, have echo a lot of the wisdom that was shared by my um, respected colleagues. And, um, you know, a lot of the lessons that we learned in partnering with mutual aid groups that already were structured with um, that indigenous lens and that lens to not replicate um, any of these harmful practices and that acceptance and acknowledgement that even in doing this work there's no such thing as being apolitical being indigenous in this world means having to carry all of these fights that are always being waged against our lands, our territories, our resources, and our peoples. And being in the midst of a pandemic hasn't changed any of those realities and those responsibilities to address this multifaceted attack against our homelands. And so as we move forward, um, some of the best, the best practices that we learned is that, um, you know, the, the focus on, on aid needs to also be a focus on planting the seeds for energy sovereignty, for food sovereignty, water sovereignty, for restoring our traditional practices of building and maintaining our shelters for our people in a way that is safe and sustainable and, and climate appropriate, and to provide and restore our traditional forms of health care. I am so thankful to our traditional knowledge holders, um, particularly an organization called the Dine, Dine Hatathli Association. Um, because when we started this pandemic, we only had 300 medicine men and women left in our communities. And so protecting our knowledge holders was of vital importance. And instead of um, uh, instead of, uh, you know, shying away from their responsibilities, our knowledge holders organized early on before this pandemic to work together to figure out how do they continue to carry out the ceremonies, the earth offerings, the, the, the prayers that our people in our nation need as a whole. And they coordinated this to do this while protecting their health and protecting each other all around our nation. And the, the disconnect and why it's so important to root ourselves in our indigenous values and, and looking at relief efforts and recovery efforts is that despite them doing that and despite how precious and how vulnerable these traditional knowledge holders are and how important they are for restoring the health, the mental, the spiritual, and, and, and the physical health of our people, um, the, our, our tribal government didn't give them any resources from any of the money that was allocated through the CARES Act to help our nation respond and recover from the impacts of this crisis. And so, um, you know, with when Francois uh, shared the prophecy of this great migration, it's something that's been very close to my heart because as we were talking about these long-term recovery needs, we don't have water. And the impacts of climate change and now the impacts of this of, of this forest, these forest fires in California, the impacts of overuse of our groundwater for extractive industries, this has all created very dire conditions so that even those who we were trying to support in growing food and in, in collecting and harvesting traditional foods and traditional medicines are finding it even harder to carry 
without those activities because we don't have water. And so as we move forward, and as Mirna said, um, we build, we investing and building an agenda for transformation is extremely important. And it's going to be rooted in things like data sovereignty, and like exercising self-determination at every level that we organize, at making sure our actions are rooted in anti-colonization, and that we're embedding in everything we do, healing practices and community accountability, so that we prevent lateral and internal oppression and violence and of, of utmost priority we must make sure that every government at every level respects the rights of indigenous peoples because we are constantly carrying out these battles on multiple fronts like I said before but also because to return back to the land like Francois said we have to be able to have our rights secured to restore those practices and to do it in a way that makes sense for our people, for our communities, and for long-term recovery uh, so that our future generations aren't inadvertently impacted by everything that is going on in this moment, but that they learn and, they, and they're gifted with our learnings and our experience of moving through and surviving through this period and building a world that that is much better than what we have inherited. That is the prayer of our ancestors. It's the prayer that we have laid down for ourselves and for future generations. And that's what's going to help guide us forward to, to manifest this beautiful vision and a future for our people. Mahomes, Neen, thank you so much. Uh, for all that you shared, I mean, the, uh, the recommendations at, at the end, excellent, all things uh, that you've brought up, I mean, your work on the ground, just so inspiring. And I want to thank you and all those who you work with uh, for doing that critical work and really highlighting that even the, the governments of our own people sometimes also need to be held accountable. I mean, that kind of introspection into reflection is also important for us as, as indigenous peoples, you know, looking at our leadership, how are they responding to the communities? And, and, and then, as you also mentioned, this is on top of the ongoing assaults that we face as indigenous people at every level that's been going on for generations. So I just, it's just such a powerful presentation and really, uh, I think, tied everything in uh, very nicely. We saw uh, really the, the interrelationship of all these uh, presentations, the, the connections uh, and uh, how our people are connected, even just across uh, these Americas and around the world. Uh, and so I wanna thank you for that. So what we're gonna do now uh, is open it up to uh, some questions. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're asking folks, if you do have a question uh, that you want uh, one of the speakers or all the speakers to respond to, we we'll just have you um, type that into the chat. I'll uh, read it out and uh, we'll keep going from there. We have about uh, just a little over 15 minutes. I do want to close with, with some announcements uh, before we end uh, the webinar today. But uh, the first one comes from Andrea Carmen. And uh, this is just generally to all the panelists. What role or response from the millions of indigenous peoples who live in cities what is the role or response for, million, for millions of indigenous peoples who live in cities around the world? What can they do to survive? Or can they even do it there? So again, uh, we're talking about our urban indigenous populations. What can they do uh, you know, to take on some of this looking ahead or preparation that many of you, that all of you spoke about actually? So this is open up to any panelists uh, whoever wants to come in and uh, respond, uh, please, the floor is yours. Oh, I, 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 I'm looking at, Andrea, at the city of Auckland right now, we're in what we call regional shutdown. So that it, though this, the last three, five cases were found in Auckland in Tamaki Makaurau, um, and really amongst the Pacific Islands and Maori, so you know who it's been attacking. So the idea is they regionally locked it down. That means nobody's in and out of Auckland. 
no one. They have, you know, so that what happens is that they can contain and, and see where ours, but, and, and it's given time to track where that came from. How did they get that? We have a tracking system that you have to sign in wherever you go. If you're at, you know, you have to sign your name so that it's easy for people to be tracked if, say, the COVID came into their, into their space at that time. How can they, they be helped? Basically, we get into what we call bubbles, family bubbles, and ensure that we are tested you know, the, to test themselves. And in Auckland, there are a lot more testing stations that they can be tested at because they can't move in or out. And they're asked to stay home so that they don't move about the city to, to, to infect others. And no more than, a, you know, you cannot have 100 people in together at all without social distancing. It's not, and children are being kept home from school there's a whole lot of things that go straight into place straight away in order to protect our most vulnerable, are our elders and our children. So there's a real big push to, to protect and to take care of by our younger. I mean, I enjoyed your corridor, Janine. This really powerful. You're the future leader of all of us. So, you know, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, we have to talk to them by phones and say, come on, you can do this, whānau. We have to make sure you don't get pandemic. So that support goes that way. And, you know, and we can send them a little bit of money to, to, to help them to survive through that time. So it's family to family. You know, those are our families that are living up there in Auckland. So we have to offer them to or help them as well even from this distance that so we can never get there to see them because it's clocked down and there are lots, you just simply can't travel there or travel through. Even if you come from, you know, you have to go through Auckland, you can't even travel through. You have to stay home to help them to, you know, to get a lot better. So I think it's just a whole lot of us just helping out hugely where we can. And you're right, Janine, when money comes into play, our people get stupid. Um, and that's simple as. But, you know, we've got to stop being romantic about our people as well, because they're very westernized anyway, as well. So to decolonize is a big process. And so to process that decolonization stuff is to act it ourselves within here, this first person. So then they can watch me and they know, oh, ooh, ooh, yeah, 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 I'm going to be like her. Um, but, you know, we're not. we co so busy romantically, put out all these fabulous things, and really we're not really practicing them ourselves. So when we, we've got to be careful of what we say from here. Um, with those people up there, yep, yeah, I'm not a Christian. I don't like Christianity, eh? It was an invader into this country and took away our natural things. So basically, I, how would I then do that? So I make food. I have boxes out of my garden of fresh vegetables and think it's ended up there. In the mail. Because the mail can take it up there. We can't. But anyway, those are some of the ideas around how you... And I don't ever, ever believe that our medicine will heal an invader. Is this? This is just another invader. Thank you for that, Hine. Uh, does anybody else uh, from our panel uh, want to respond to this? Alguien más quiere responder a esto? I, I hear uh, Rebecca, uh, the translator. Okay. Just some things that I've seen in our region. Uh, obviously, the indigenous peoples in the city have been involved. Have are part of the most vulnerable groups because they do not have any kind of system, a social system of protection. They have, are living in situations where they do not have good health sanitation. Uh, but we have seen groups that have organized and they have translated information about preventive measures about COVID-19 into their own languages. And they have used different measures uh, like 
um, different media like radio communications so that this information can definitely reach the communities and help them and another thing that we've seen is the increase in the use of traditional medicine also within the urban context although it does present some challenges because they're not being protected they're not protecting it. And we're talking about Cochabamba, Bolivia. People are taking the plants, they use them, but then they don't protect the plants in the proper, proper way, like the intangible use, but also to protect the plant and maintain the plant. I also think that another thing that our, we've been dealing with is how to, involve the youth how to share this intergenerational how to share our knowledge with other generations how to be there to be reciprocity what we do is we take food to other cities to other areas and there has been this exchange and i do believe that some um, recommendations for the urban areas to work with the youth especially to have this intergenerational share of comp of communication so that they understand the indigenous resilience, protection, uh, traditional knowledge is a subject that we need to continue to work on in the urban areas. And also in, with among the different agencies, we've seen how different women in Peru, they have struggled so much so that they don't close down the small, uh, farmers market fairs so that they can go sell their products there so that at these farmers markets um, they can sell their wares and their products so that they can get money in order to survive so we need to advocate with the local of local governments we need to advocate with those who are making decisions in the urban areas in the cities in order to have protection centers and then to have measures protocols for health measures for our protection and then in the future we need to think about and really work on this it which is, is tied to the sdgs what are the protect social protection measures from the indigenous vision that should be promoted within the urban context for future events that may come about like this pandemic thank you so much uh, mirna for that um if there are there any other comments on this uh particular question if not we do have another one uh i see janine uh did you just uh, oh francois did you want to say something okay i'm uh i just want to respond to that question uh i've never lived in a city but i uh at this moment, I am a, a professor at the University of Alberta as an adjunct professor to the School of Public Health. Soon we're going to be using the Zoom to talk to the students. Here in the North, we are starting to do that. But I think one thing about that question, the International Treaty Council could become, we need to shift of our how we do business i think in one time pretty soon in the future you should just you should uh, put one whole program for all the young people that are living in the cities that i want to tie into this and listen to the elders of how they can begin to migrate back to their land so the Andreas office become, can become an advocate to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Janine? Yeah, um, I just want to share my experience both with the Dith Astan Command Center, but also just with relief efforts in general. Um, we've learned that there are unique impacts to our populations in urban areas, particularly when they don't have in health insurance, when they don't have job security, are they working, are in 
they're employed um, by jobs that were shut down early. And this led to a, a chain reaction really quickly of them losing income, losing food security, losing housing, and losing all of their resources and safety nets in, in urban centers, and then having no resources specific for their population to help deal with those impacts. And on the other hand, um, we've also had the experience of our urban urban youth and our urban professionals organizing really quickly to build supply lines that we don't otherwise have access to on reservations. And so there was there was both this, this unique vulnerability and also this unique strength when it came to our populations in urban areas. And one of the things that that's part of our decolonizing is to break out of the idea that our traditional homelands are confined to these boundaries that we have left. All of it is traditional homelands. And the work that we have to to do in our in our reservations or in whatever our demarcated territories are is the same work that needs to be done in our cities and our, our our relatives that are there are the voice and the change makers that can help lead that transformation in urban areas and I've seen this happen I know our, our youth are are building food sovereignty movements, are building decolonial movements and anti-colonial movements in whatever way they can, using whatever tools are available to them in these urban areas. And they're also really important spaces of cross-tribal solidarity, where you know our, our youth gravitate towards each other from different tribes, different nations, from different parts of the world to rethink what it means, what those responsibilities mean as indigenous people um, uh, working from that intersection of all our different cultures. And so as we work towards recovery and really learn from this pandemic and how to hold our relatives, whether they're enrolled, are officially recognized with our tribes, are living on our reservations, our traditional territories are not, I think this is all part of our healing process to take back the land and taken back, not in a sense of like privatization or ownership, but in a sense of restoring that collective responsibility and that collective consciousness that we share no matter where we are at and, and on this earth. Uh, Janine and all of our incredible presenters today, uh, it's just been a really uh, powerful, powerful session. Um, right now, we're about uh, just a couple of minutes left before we are ending this session for today. I apologize for the questions that are coming in now. Um, I don't think that we will have time for them, uh, but there was a good question from Daisy Francor about uh, how do we see opportunities uh, for philanthropy and the finance sector to support indigenous uh, people's post-COVID, but I think that um, there is time for this question. Remember, we'll be having a whole series that's going to be talking about looking ahead to life after COVID. What have we learned? What should we keep and strengthen? What do we do? What do we need to change or let go of? We'll be having these discussions over the next few Fridays. And next uh, Friday on the uh, 28th, uh, we're going to have another distinguished panel. Uh, coming up. And I just want to just let you know that we'll have uh, Francisco Calizai, who is the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples speaking. We'll have Wilton, Lil Wilton Littlechild, who's the International Chief for Treaties 6, 7, and 8 of Canada. We'll have Bumpy Kanahere, who's Head of State for the Sovereign Nation of Hawaii and Lucy Malenke, who's Maasai, and she's the executive director of the Indigenous Information Network. So we're really trying to cover indigenous perspectives uh, from around the world on this topic. And as you could see, we can really continue to talk uh, for hours and days uh, on this subject, and we will do that, but over the next few Fridays. So we really hope that you tune back in and uh, that you uh, are with us uh, next, next week, next Friday on the 28th for our next panel. And I, once again, um, today's panel is just incredible. Hini Wirangi Kohu, um, Francois Paulette, Mina Cunningham, Jeannie Yazi, and of course our introduction by Andrea Carmen. Just thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for your inspirational presentations, 
And uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to work together uh, at this or any other level, uh, moving ahead into the future, uh, in a future looking ahead past COVID, right? But uh, even now in the present. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm Roberto Mucaro Borrero. Uh, Taino, I really had an, it was really an honor for me to moderate the uh, conversation today, and I'm looking forward to next week. I hope you can all tune in. You can find more information about the program at the IITC website. Just type in uh, www.iitc.org. Thank you to our translators, Rebecca and Jimmy, who always uh, work very hard, and also behind the uh, scenes, Chris Honani for helping set up our technical uh, the technical aspects of this program. So until next week, uh, I just uh, wish you all well, uh, just prayers and and, uh, and good thoughts for everyone who needs them and for the earth, of course. So thank you very much. I think, Chris, we can uh, end the, the session now. <laughs>